Kitco News special coverage of the Future Blockchain Summit is brought to you by Cook Finance, a revolution in DeFi asset management. Here with the living legend, Ken Aronoff, one of the greatest drummers of all time who's still alive. You've performed with John Melanchol, Bon Jovi, Lady Gaga, Bruno Mars, John McCartney, Paul McCartney. Who am I missing? The Smashing London. Pumpkins, Johnny Smashing Cash, Pumpkins, Willie yeah. Nelson, Chris Christopherson, then the R&B, Ray Charles, Buddy Guy, B.B. Carey. I'm all over the place. You've got about 300 million records under your name, 60 Grammys to your title. Yeah. I mean, I, what, what's next for you? <laughs> well, keep doing what I'm doing. <laughs> and, <laughs> keep doing what I'm doing, sustaining, you know? And, uh, you know, and then I pivoted some of that into speaking. Yeah. When my autobiography came out, I just started speaking and then I, I met an agent and started to realize there's a business problem and I, I worked hard on it. I mean, I got writers and equipment, you know, it's like anything else. Like, you know what it's like. You practice violin your whole life and to be able to play, you know. I'm, a, I'm an amateur musician. We talked offline. I'm going to talk music with you in a bit. But first, I want to get your message here. You, you're all the way out here in Dubai. This is a tech conference. It's a blockchain conference. What brings you here? Well, I got invited, you know, to, and I thought and to speak and perform, because when I speak, I perform. Right. And I have a motivational thing. It's, uh, you know, teamwork, leadership, innovation, creativity, staying relevant. Yeah. And I talk about tools and technology, adapt or die. You know, those are important, those important things in any, in any field, music or business, sports, anything. You have to adapt or die. Right, well that's, I mean, you were giving examples in yeah. your, throughout your career, over the bands you've worked with. Give us some examples of how you've had to adapt in the music industry to stay relevant. Use the keyword relevant, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's stay relevant. Like, for example, when uh, John Mellencamp had the song Jack and Diane, it was kind of like a folksy song. Yeah. We didn't know what to do with it. We were too young to arrange. And I walked in the studio one day and the, and the producer had this Lin One drum machine. Now, drum machines were being used, Hall Notes were doing it on their stuff. And then, uh, of course, uh, Phil Collins in the air tonight with the big famous drum fill. Mm -hmm. So it was starting to just start. Uh, John Mellencamp heard the Bee Gees using it next door and said, what's that? Right. And they said it was Lin One Drum Machine. The, the basic concept was we didn't know what to do with this song, so we thought we'd use new technology and new sounds. I felt threatened but it, it, because I, all of a sudden I was being replaced by a machine. I felt like I was in the horse and buggy business and the car just showed up and it was going to replace. It was a long time ago, yeah. Yeah, an industry. So what happened was I programmed what I was playing on the machine right. and had eight outputs so they could bring it up on eight channels on the board and they were going to mix it and, yeah. and, it, and it just died. And so that John said, you've got to have real drums and bring it in after the second course. And I was like, I, I was thinking I have to save the song to save my career. And uh, it's long and short of it. I came up with this iconic drum fill, but dude, it wasn't, I was, I was crapping in my pants. Right. It was a pitiful moment because I, it was an adapt or die moment. Adapt to the new technology or you're gonna lose your job. Well, electronic music came out, I mean, 70s, 80s, you've got the, uh, got the MIDI stuff coming out and you've got the program drum kits yeah, yeah, like you yeah. talked about. And yeah. nowadays you've got EDM, basically it's all synthetic stuff. Yeah. I mean, you don't try to compete with that style, right? You're not trying to, you're not, you, you've got your own thing going on. You've, yeah. got, a, you, you've got your yeah. own groove. What I believe is that humans are feeling creatures and that stuff is cool, but at a certain point, you know, if, if you're playing an instrument and you've got all this emotion coming out, it, it's touching. I mean, it grabs people's hearts. So when I play my sounds, my fills, my feel in my studio, I make sure that it sounds very analog and organic. And so nobody can sound like me and nobody can sound like you. So I try to bring that out and I try to get full takes yeah. from beginning to end because it sounds different. If you get a full take, you can hear you can hear that everything that you're going yeah. through emotionally and you know, to get a full take, you gotta be perfect. And so you can feel that, whatever that feeling is that I'm feeling, you can Well, hear. a machine can never replicate the energy you have. I mean, I just saw you on stage, it's an incredible performance, but you're kind of a life coach now, you do that kind of, you do, you do that service as well, but like, you, 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 you have a message for everybody here at the conference, which is basically, you know, innovate or die. And what you're, the story you're telling right now could be applied to all areas of business. Oh, yeah. You've got new innovations coming up. How do you adapt to that, right? I mean, in your case, you've got synthetic drums. How do you adapt to that? What were you thinking when that kind of thing came out? Well, when I saw that drum machine, I freaked. 
So I thought, like, what the hell? I got replaced by two drummers on the album before because I had never, I, I didn't have enough experience making records. That was yeah. the beginning of right. But man, when that machine showed up, I was like, what? And so, but then it, it became, we put the two together. Real drums on top of the machine. Right. It became John Mellencamp's biggest hit, Jack and Diane. So suddenly, what I thought was going to, you know, it was going to replace me, I actually teed me up. I became, it's one of the most iconic drum fills in pop radio. That's incredible. That's it's still played on the radio and Spotify and, yeah. you know, probably TikToks for that matter. Well, your career spanned decades. I mean, yeah. the music industry, you've evolved with the different styles. How did you do that? Well, we'll talk about your background a little bit more later. Well, I mean, you know, you would get pigeonholed. Oh, he's a country drummer. He's a rock drummer. I mean, the same guy who goes and plays with the Highwaymen. I made two Highwaymen records. That's Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Chris Christopherson, and Waylon Jennings. Right. That drummer doesn't usually go on tour with the Smashing Pumpkins. That's right. Or make a record with Alice Cooper or make a record with yeah. Tony Iommi from Sabbath. It doesn't happen, yeah, but yeah. it did with me. And then that same guy doesn't play with Ray Charles and Buddy Guy. And then, then do Celine Dion and, and uh, then the girls like Michelle Branch, Avril Lavigne and, and uh, you know, Alanis Morissette. It's, it, it produ producers were hiring me and this one producer in particular, John was, he thought, well, he can do, Kenny can play anything. Plus, he's got the right personality to motivate the other musicians. So why wouldn't he hire me? Yeah. What's the most important aspect of success for an artist? Is it your talent, your work, your connections, your personality? What, what did they uh, put the pieces together for somebody? All who's, uh, of it, all the all above. It, I mean, yeah. you can be super, super talented, but if you're an asshole, unless you're the leader of the band, you can get away with it more. But if you're not a leader in the band and you're in the service business like I am, yeah. man, I mean, you just have to learn how to, you gotta be a great player, but you gotta learn how to get along with people. And I talk about it. You have to be able to connect with people, communicate with them on a personal level so then you can collaborate. Well, I mean, look, that, that's, you're a very personal guy. You've worked with legends, living legends. Some of them aren't even around anymore. Yeah. You've collaborated with the different bands. How do you go from one band, one artist to another? And uh, how do you communicate with them and figure out what kind of style they want? You know, how, how you fit into that picture? Because that applies, I mean, lessons you've learned probably apply to businesses as well. I, man, you know, I think I just was raised a certain way where that wasn't a difficult thing. You know, I, I don't mind switching from, actually makes it exciting to switch from one artist to another and and just uh, get into what they're into you know really get into who they are it's like being an actor and getting into a different role yeah. like method acting a, a lot of people might not know this about you but you had your roots in classical music you trained classical drums you were invited to play uh for classical orchestras actually you and i both did the aspen music <laughs> festival which is a classical music festival uh, I, I, you know, I did it way after you, of course, but uh, yeah, how did you, why did you transition from, you know, you worked with Leonard Bernstein, how did you transition from that world into rock and roll? Well, because I started at rock and roll in high school, I, since I was 10 yeah. until I was 18, I was playing only rock and roll, and then it was time to go to college, I, I picked music as my major, and back then they only had, easy to get a major in classical or jazz, and I happened to be studying with the percussionists from the Boston Symphony Orchestra because they were only three miles from my house in the summer. Yeah. Tanglewood was only three miles away. Yeah. It's the summer home of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Yeah. And when it was time to go to college, I was okay enough to get into University of Massachusetts. And the number one school of music is Indiana in Bloomington. Number two is Juilliard. Number three is Eastman. Eastman was five miles up the road. I, I applied to uh, transfer I got in, but they didn't have room for transfer students. And then I auditioned for Aspen, thinking, well, if I get in, I'll, maybe I'll transfer to Juilliard. And uh, I got into Aspen at the last minute, and uh, that's with George Gaber, the, the head of the department in Indiana University. So I went, I'm auditioning for him. And he told me to come back in January. I went, no, nope, nope, I want to audition this summer. We argued about it, and finally he was so flattered that I wanted to go and study with him like I had to do it doing okay I auditioned up there and got in and, and did Aspen change your mind about pursuing uh, the, the, the things you kind of wanted to do or maybe you pivoted later I I was just committed to doing a great job in classical music period and just committed but I was always playing in rock bands funk bands jazz bands 
I was always playing rock and roll. I just wouldn't admit that that's what I was going to do because, see, if you get an orchestra, you got a job. But how do you make it in rock and roll? You go to a city and just hang out and meet people, and it's just so uncertain. There must have been something about rock and roll that told you, that spoke to you on the inside, that told you, look, this is, this is the style I want to do for the rest of my life. Well, yeah, because when I got into the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra, yeah. uh, I turned it down. For, I turned down certainty for uncertainty. One of the best orchestras in the world. Not, that's Israeli Philharmonic. They got the best violins. Wow, there's some loudness here. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I turned it down. That was a pivotal moment. I was like, oh my God, I'm turning down a gig. I'm going to get a paycheck. And there aren't that many orchestras. And I went, I followed my heart. What was your first rock gig after uh, college, remember? You mean famous one? Yeah. Mellencamp was the one. That's where I got my big break. Yeah. And I got fired after five weeks of being in the band right, because, right. from making the record yeah. because they, the producer wanted seasoned session guys. Yeah, well, you're, you're a very versatile musician. You told me also you played a, a, percussion, a, a percussion version of Sanson's Introduction of Monica Pichetta, which is a violin piece, oh, yeah. a violin concerto, 10 minute piece, one of the most difficult pieces yeah. for strings. And you did that on the marimba. Yeah. How, did you, how did you do that? Well, it just so happens that violin music lays on the marimba perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> and, in, 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 in Indiana University, and in most universities, you study percussion and you're doing the classical performance degree, you're going to have to play a mallet piece. And so violin music and cello music is the best literature out there. And when I saw Itzhak Perman play right. the Rondo Capricioso, Introduction to Rondo Capricioso, yeah. in, in, in Indiana, I went, that's the most gorgeous piece I've ever seen. And technically virtuosic. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, you and so it, yeah. I, I practiced three hours a day for 365 days to be able to play that piece very slowly and increase the speed. And I was in my recital and my teacher asked me to audition for a concerto competition and I won. So I performed it in an opera hall the size of the New York Met and with a 60 piece orchestra. Yeah. We talked about the electric drum. How else has technology changed the music industry over the last four well, decades? LPs, to yeah. cassettes, to CDs, downloading, streaming, and eventually music's free because you can get it on anything you want on YouTube. Well, where's it headed from here, the industry? I mean, it's coming back a little bit in that, you know, people want to hear LPs again and people, um, you know, um, they like the real thing. They have to hear, watch people react and interact with each other, but it's never going to be back to what it was. It, nothing ever go. When you move forward, it just moves forward. You know, um, there are kids growing up, and and they just don't, they don't. They're, what's popular in their circles is more technical. Uh, it's more EDM. It's more uh, not technical, more electronic more sampled, that's the sound of their, kind of like, almost like the soundtrack of their life. Yeah. Can you last question before I let you go? Yeah. Any advice for young musicians who want to make it in the industry today? Well, just, you know, if it's making you feel good and you love doing it, don't ever let anybody discourage you from doing it. Right. Even if you have to work another job so you can be a musician, it's worth it. Because music really does bring joy to your life, mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And, uh, you know, there aren't the budgets. People aren't buying records, so there aren't budgets for record labels to sign artists. But you can make music that makes you feel good. That's that's like taking a vitamin every day. It's yeah. really healthy for you. And it, you can put your music out all, back, all back by in, yourself. Back in the day, you needed a label to get published. You now you just label. put it on YouTube yourself. Yep. You know, enjoy the moment. Kenny, I appreciate your time so much. Awesome, man. Cheers, man. Thank you. Big fan of yours. Thanks for Thank coming you. on the show. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you for watching Kitco. Stay tuned. Kitco News special coverage of the Future Blockchain Summit is brought to you by Cook Finance, a revolution in DeFi asset management.